Good afternoon, uh, everybody who's uh, on the line, and our reporters and those who are watching um, remotely. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here in the way that you are here. I'm also with um, our Deputy Minister of Education, Dana Rudy, and I welcome her and thank her for the work that she is doing and the entire Department of Education. I uh, also, of course, want to, as we always do, uh, begin by thanking our teachers, our EAs, our bus drivers, the janitorial staff, everyone who is working incredibly hard in our education system. Like uh, every part of society, it is a difficult time. It doesn't matter what area of society you're working in or what your role is, it is a challenge for sure. And uh, those who are working in the school system have certainly taken on the challenge and are doing an excellent job, uh, not only of educating our students, which is of course uh, our top priority, uh, but then, of course, uh, keeping them safe, which is also uh, a critical priority at this time. I uh, would acknowledge the uh, parents, of course, who are also adjusting to a number of different things, and our students who are having a most unusual school year, but are still, of course, there uh, learning by and large and are, um, are also uh, benefiting from the great work of all those in the school system. So I know that there's been much anticipation about today's uh, announcement and, and uh, there will have been uh, many who wish that it will have come sooner and I hope that uh, everyone will understand that uh, the decisions that are made around um, schools don't just involve the education system but of course it involves those stakeholders who are in the system but, but also public health because uh, we have to uh, be well aligned and uh, following the information and the advice of our public health leaders and understanding that there is a context that decisions are made that aren't just in the education system. We have to be uh, aware of what is happening more broadly in the Manitoba community when it comes to COVID-19 and uh, ensure that our decisions uh, match their public advice as well. So after consultations with public health, uh, we are announcing that we will move to a period of two weeks of full remote learning for grades 7 to 12 following the traditionally scheduled Christmas break. Kindergarten to grade 6 students will be able to continue to attend school in the regular times that they uh, would be expected to, uh, but families who choose to keep their students at home in that K-6 to age range are able to do so. The remote learning period then will be from January 4th until January 15th with students expected to return in class on the uh, January 18th date, unless of course there are other public health uh, issues that arise at that time. Divisions have been planning for months going back into the summer for uh, the different potentialities during this um, school year. So obviously they did remote learning in March. It was more unexpected at that time and less, uh, less planned, but uh, they certainly took that on as well uh, with a great deal of professionalism and everyone performed to the best of their abilities at that time. Uh, more time was afforded during the summer and now in the fall and there's been a tremendous amount of experience with remote learning in the school system either because uh, there are students who are immune compromised who have been home or maybe um, you know there's been a cohort that's been sent home but there's been a good deal of experience in the system overall. We have added two additional PD days uh, that was announced uh, a few weeks ago and that was in response to questions and concerns that we had or we were getting from, uh, from teachers in terms of wanting to have more planning time. I'm also uh, providing more information today about the funding allocations for schools in Manitoba. Uh, we have been, we committed weeks ago that there would be $185 million available for the Safe Return to School Fund that is made up of the savings that were uh, incurred by the school divisions from the um, limited school use in, uh, in spring. And, uh, and then the provincial support that was provided and announced uh, in summer and then additional federal support of $85 million. Uh, so in total, that's $185 million. We have allocated $44 million uh, to school divisions and independent schools 
on a per pupil basis and that'll be focused on staffing needs of course and uh, those other needs that are occurred. This is in addition to the $32 million funding on a per pupil basis that was previously announced for the school divisions bringing the total to about $76 million. In addition, there is a $39.4 million safe restart contingency fund for which the uh, school divisions can apply for as the needs arise uh, in their various areas. And then, of course, additionally, there was money that was uh, held by the school divisions for, um, for the uh, savings that they incurred in spring. So the $185 million is fully allocated. Uh, and um, will continue to be um, distributed to the uh, school divisions. We uh, know that there's already been about $30 million, or well, more than that. We haven't got the last month accounted for, uh, so it's probably uh, closer to 40 or $45 million that's already been spent uh, on such things as 400 additional staff, primarily teachers, uh, in the lead up to this, um, this school year. So these decisions, while we know, uh, have various impacts. The, um, moving to remote learning for two weeks for the grade 7 to 12 uh, in particular we know can have an impact uh, on families and they're not made uh, lightly the decisions but they are made in consultation with public health and with the understanding that we believe and still believe that the best place for students uh, to learn is in the classroom where it is safe to do so and uh, we continue to uh, appreciate the great work that public health uh, is doing with us as a department and the school system overall in a most challenging time. And so uh, with this announcement, we uh, expect to see um, not only the financial support that I know that uh, school divisions and schools have been looking for, but also that it's a, a good balance for um, teachers and for parents and for ultimately students, which is uh, our key priority. So with that, I uh, believe, uh, Dana, do you have some comments as well? I'm good. Dana wants to go right to questions, so if you um, uh, want to open the line to questions, we'll begin. Thank you very much, Minister. A reminder to our reporters on the line, you will have one preliminary and one follow-up question. Up first this afternoon, from the Winnipeg Free Press, Maggie Hi, Minister. I wanted to find out why the decision was made to have this two-week buffer period after the holidays rather than taking that approach before holidays, before the holidays, or doing both and sandwiching the break in between. You know, it's a really good question, and, and there was a lot of discussion back and forth between education from, from an education perspective about what might be uh, most beneficial, and then from a public health perspective, what might be most uh, beneficial. Ultimately, we, we landed on going to after the uh, Christmas break uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, it gives a little bit more time for preparation for that movement to uh, remote learning, even though there's been a lot of remote learning happening already in the school system. But we understand that anytime there's a, a significant holiday, the uh, uh, contact patterns that uh, students might have uh, can change during uh, that time. I mean, there's a bit of a routine now, but that routine is disrupted by, um, by the holiday break. And we have seen traditionally in other places uh, and in Manitoba where there is that uh, holiday break that the COVID-19 numbers can uh, go up after the break. So this provides from a public health perspective um, some additional assurance just to see what those numbers are looking like. We have, may have lost Maggie. We'll move on to Joe at Global. Still here. I just I, I couldn't hear the minister. I wasn't sure if he was done talking because I saw on my video screen he was still talking. Um, my follow-up question for the minister. Um, I'm sure, sure teachers are wondering right now, particularly those in K-6, to uh, you've said in the past that teachers will not be asked to do both remote learning and uh, in-person teaching at the same time. So who is going to be responsible for doing this remote learning for both the K-6 to category as well as that 7 to 12 category? So from an operational perspective, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things. One is that we'll, of course, work with our 
education uh, partners and school divisions who will help to operationalize uh, the planning, but also the remote learning center, which we announced now several weeks ago, will be um, operational and providing uh, some additional support to those uh, teachers who are engaged uh, in uh, remote learning. And uh, of course, there's been a lot of experience now with remote learning, um, but most importantly, it is for a time limited period. It is for those two weeks. Uh, and so providing some assurance on the length of time is helpful and then providing those additional supports through the remote learning center, uh, I think is also helpful. From Global News, Joe. Hi there, uh, Joe from uh, Global here. Uh, if I remember correctly, in the spring, uh, when this uh, first happened, the move was supposed to be for two weeks. How confident are you that uh, it's just going to last for two weeks, this new setup, this time around? Well, making predictions during a pandemic uh, has proven not to be a good business to be in. Um, I do think, though, um, you know, now many months into this, we have a, a better understanding of some of the dy dynamics. We've, I think, proven um, that the school system can operate uh, relatively well during a pandemic and keep uh, keep uh, people safe, keep the parents, or sorry, keep the students safe and keep the teachers safe. So we've now been able to, I think, to show, uh, because of the good work of those who are working in the school system and public health and developing a plan, that uh, we're able to, uh, to have the schools open. Not that, that it is perfect, uh, and not that there aren't challenges. There are. Uh, during a pandemic, there are going to be difficulties and things that are unforeseen. And uh, we try to adjust to those um, as best that we can. But I think that uh, there's been a good track record in demonstrating that um, those who are working in the school system have done an excellent job of supporting our, our students. So uh, now we obviously hope that our numbers uh, go down in terms of the number of cases and, of course, the number who are in, uh, in hospital with COVID-19 because the hospital numbers are, of course, uh, what's critical to this. And, um, and we can, we're hoping that those numbers will, will be uh, reduced. And, uh, and that we'll be able to return our, our children to school. But we've, we've made it pretty clear from the beginning that is our priority, is to be able to have schools operating, and I think we've demonstrated that. And uh, leading up to today, there was a lot of talk about uh, potentially extending, uh, just simply extending the Christmas break. Uh, what happened to that? Well, I don't know where all the, the talk was coming from. I mean, I think that is Education Minister made it... Um, you know, our priority and, and said it publicly that we want to be able to keep students learning. Uh, our preference would be to keep them stu learning in the classroom where they choose to be, um, but um, we want them to keep learning. So whether that's remotely or in the classroom, um, the key is that we don't want the uh, education of our young people, of students, to stop. So um, there is going to be uh, a break, a holiday for those working in the school system as regularly scheduled. I think it's about two and a half weeks or so. So that's important for those who are working in the education system and absolutely uh, we want them to, uh, to have that break and to enjoy it. Um, but the primary function of the education system is to educate students and where we can do so safely, we want that to happen. And uh, so we uh, will have some additional remote learning obviously now and particularly for those older students, but it's always been our key objective is to ensure that uh, the school system is there to uh, educate students. From the Brandon Sun, Kyle. Uh, hello, sister. I was wondering if you could go into more detail about uh, the exceptions uh, to the rule about uh, for grade 7, 12 students. You said that students with special needs within that uh, category uh, can be accommodated in a classroom setting. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you could just expand on that if possible. Yeah, I can take that one. So we have built in as part of our plan a focus on ensuring that uh, continuity of learning for kids uh, that, are, that have special needs to be able to go to school. Uh, so we have outlined that in our guidance and we've been working with school divisions uh, around ensuring that, um, that we're applying those in a consistent way. So we will continue to work with school divisions to make sure that all students uh, with special needs can be accommodated if, if desired. Obviously there may be some students also that choose to do remote learning uh, during that period of time for grades 7 through 12 and so we'll obviously accommodate those needs too. And back when the Remote Learning Center was announced uh, early in November, 
they said the center, uh, you guys said the center was going to be staffed by 100 teachers and 20 educational assistants. Is that still the plan uh, for, uh, for the new year? Yes, so hiring is currently underway. So there'll be about 120 additional staff that are hired for the remote learning center. And then in addition to that, there's a remote learning support team that's comprised of about 20 additional staff, including clinicians and teachers and uh, other supports. And so those, those positions have also been hired. So it's about 140 in total. Thank you. From CJOB, Will. Hi, good afternoon to you both. I'm just wondering, have, uh, has there been any thought to extending the mask mandate to kindergarten to grade three students as the teacher society has been requesting? So one of the things uh, when I met with the teacher society in the summer um, about, and we had a number of uh, different meetings, but about the return to school was that we would, they asked me to, uh, to commit to following the public health advice. And, uh, and we said that it was our intention, of course, to follow the advice that we were getting from Public Health in Manitoba, from Dr. Rusin, so we continue to do that. So the advice is not to extend uh, the mask mandate at this point to, uh, to the lower grades. Um, Dr. Rusin, I think, has articulated at different times why he doesn't feel that that is a, um, uh, is a necessity or an important thing to do. Uh, at this point, and so we'll continue to rely, as much as I appreciate the feedback from MTS, and I genuinely do, uh, there's been excellent feedback from the Manitoba Teachers Society. Uh, on matters like this, we defer to public health. Okay, thank you for that. Um, it has been a challenging year all around, no doubt, as you say. Um, I'm just wondering, has there been any sort of noticeable drop in students' grades or learning outcomes in the first half of this school year? So I don't know that uh, you know we'll have that kind of assessment at this point. Um, we'll we'll be seeing, of course, you know, summative assessments and different sorts of assessments as uh, this school year and other school years go on. Um, you know, I would say that um, it it certainly appears that uh, the system is doing their very best to ensure that um, students are getting the highest quality education possible, recognizing they can be variable. And so, I mean, some of this is anecdotal, and it's difficult, you know, to make a lot of conclusions on, on anecdotal things. Um, there are some individuals, some students who might uh, thrive in, in, in certain environments, and some who have much more difficulty. Uh, and so I expect that we're going to see that variability uh, through this year as well. And uh, that's just the reality of when you're introducing um, a different kind of a system. Some will do better at remote learning. Um, than uh, they might have expected or that their parents might have expected and some won't do as well as they, they or their parents might have expected. So we're going to see variability and I think there's going to be lots of studies and analysis not just in Manitoba about the impact on education from the pandemic but I'm sure nationally and globally as well. From the Winnipeg Sun, Josh. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. I just want to follow up on something that Maggie uh, touched on earlier. Uh, when we look at 7 to 12, they're, they're kind of being signaled out because they are a little bit more susceptible to be, uh, to be uh, carriers or to pass the, the COVID-19 on to transmit the disease. Uh, and plus, they're over 12, so they can stay at home. But we're in the middle of the second wave where we had huge spikes in numbers. If the concern is to stop the spreading after Christmas, why weren't uh, students being held out now, during the height of the second wave, where we are seeing huge numbers of COVID-19, why aren't they being held out now? So in communication with, with public health, and we have, of course, regular and uh, consistent communication with public health, we're always asking those questions as they're doing uh, the follow-up, the contact tracing, as they're doing the analysis. Uh, how do they feel about our schools in terms of safety when it comes to, to students? And they've con consistently been saying to us that the transmission rates as compared to the rest of uh, the community shows that our schools uh, are safe and certainly relatively compared to the broader part of the community. Now, this is a bit of a different uh, time that we're going into. We all recognize that when we get into an extended uh, holiday break uh, into the winter break, the Christmas break, that uh, there's going to be changes in some of the established patterns and, uh, and based on the evidence that public health has seen 
uh, both in Manitoba and I think in other parts of Canada and North America, um, there is uh, out of a, you know some abundance of caution a desire to uh, to ensure that um, we're being proactive in trying to ensure that there isn't the um, the uptick of numbers following that break. Uh, obviously, students were home uh, during the spring uh, for remote learning. Could you tell us how that environment has changed for remote learning since the spring? Uh, what how, what's the experience going to be like for students? I know it's going to be different from uh, school division to school division, but for those who haven't been in remote learning since the spring, how is the experience going to be different? So I think that you know, you're right. It will be different from uh, division to division and maybe from school to school. But there's no question that in the spring, uh, when we moved to remote learning, um, it was um, not what, what the educators had been planning for when they began that, that school year, nor was it what parents were planning for or what students were planning for. Uh, and so we saw a lot of, you know, variability uh, where there were some school divisions, I think, you know, who maybe were able to adapt a little bit more quickly by the nature of the resources that they had or the nature of the population that they were serving, and others who really struggled at it. And that variability extended, of course, to, to students as well. Now I think uh, because of the planning that's happened by those within the school system over the, the summer, we're seeing a lot more uh, preparedness, whether that's in lesson planning or technology, to be able to deliver um, classes online. Of course, Zoom is something that may have been um, somewhat familiar to, more familiar to younger people than perhaps my generation uh, in, the, uh, in the spring. But I don't think there are many students uh, anymore who haven't had a significant uh, experience with that technology now. So even as a parent, I can tell you the experience is very different from my own son experience in, in March where um, a lot of the learning was much more, you know, paper-based being sent home. And, and now uh, because of the school division that he's in where they've been in remote learning for a couple of weeks, uh, it's much more interactive and uh, through technology. So it's a different experience for him as it is for, um, for me as a parent watching uh, his experience. So we expect, again, recognizing there'll be variability, but there's a great deal more preparedness. From CBC Radio Canada, Gavin. Hi there, Gavin from Radio Canada. Um, Minister, Deputy, Deputy Minister, what, what sort of services are offered specifically in French at the Provincial Remote Learning Support Centre? I know in, in the French language there's a, a big lack of French-speaking teachers right now. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we do have uh, uh, both French immersion and French uh, uh, programs uh, running as part of our steering committee uh, with the Remote Learning Support Centre with, with representation from DSFM and L'Oreal School Division. Uh, we do recognize that there is a recruitment issue around French teachers in particular, and so we're trying to leverage to the greatest extent possible how a remote learning support center can, can really assist uh, in that area. Uh, so we're actively planning it, I think more broadly, as we're concerned about it from a classroom perspective, uh, as well as remote learning. So it's definitely on our radar. It's included. Uh, the materials will be available in both English and French uh, for the resources as part of the repository. And the website that's been developed for the Remote Learning Support Centre is in, uh, in English and French as well. Are there any uh, francophone teachers in the, or EAs among the 140 people that are uh, going to be working there? Well, I think obviously the hope is that we're able to recruit uh, p positions uh, and then we'd have to have contingency plans in the event that, that we're not able to, to hire enough French uh, teachers. Obviously, our priority is to have the French teachers within the classroom settings to the greatest extent possible. Uh, so, uh, for at this point in time, we have not hired any of the positions. The recruitment is underway, and so uh, as soon as uh, we start that recruitment process, we'll have a better sense about uh, the extent to which people that have, may have been uh, retired or substitute teachers or others that uh, may elect to, to participate as part of the Remote Learning Support Centre. From CBC Manitoba, Erin. Good afternoon, Minister. My first question is, uh, given the trajectory of COVID-19 in Manitoba and the fact hospitals are at capacity now, and, you know, staffing for hospitals has been great over the holidays, and people will be mixing with their families over the holidays, we're going to see quite a spike in cases. Why not just say 
we're going to do this preventative measure for both K to six and seven to twelve. So I mean, that's very much uh, you know a question that we rely on public health advice for. So. You know, as a as a department of education, our priority, of course, is to ensure that students are getting uh, an education. Our preference would be that schools are open for that, uh, but we need to do it safely. So we rely on the advice of public health. They're doing the analysis on the COVID-19 numbers on a broader perspective. It's not the Department of Education that's doing that analysis. They're making the determination of how they feel. Um, you know, the numbers might look. Um, uh, in, in a day or a week or, or a month. Uh, and then, you know, we're coming alongside of that and, and giving them our input in terms of an education perspective. But, um, you know, we rely on public health advice in terms of how they feel the trajectory of, um, of COVID-19 uh, is. And they uh, support this plan. They think it's uh, both prudent and balanced uh, in terms of ensuring that students um, can, by and large, uh, have the availability of... Um, of in-class learning, uh, except for a brief uh, disruption primarily for those in the older uh, age groups. Thank you for that. Secondly, in the release, um, there's a line that says, evidence suggests that older students have a higher incidence of contracting the virus. I'm wondering if you can provide this evidence or suggest where it came from. So, I mean, that evidence is provided uh, by public health. It's something that we spoke about uh, I think even in the summer when we were talking about our back to school plans, that there had been um, you know the, that evidence uh, coming from other jurisdictions as well, not just in Manitoba. And uh, it, it deals a lot with issues around viral load as you get uh, older. Um, also, of course, the contacts that older students have are are different than um, than younger students. In many cases, they might be working in the community as an example, um, and so, you know, they might be working in a grocery store, as I did when I was uh, in high school, uh, many, a few years ago anyway, and um, and so they have different contacts, uh, and they have uh, different viral transmission, different viral loads. I'm sure that Dr. Rusin can give you a much more professional medical advice on that, but there, uh, there exists evidence, and it's existed for quite a while, that at the age, uh, older age level, there's a higher level of uh, a risk for transmission. From the Canadian press, Steve. Uh, good afternoon. I, I want to go back to the workload issue. I mean, you're having a lot of the K to six teachers all of a sudden will be doing um, a combination of uh, in class and remote learning. And I know you've got the support center there to offer support, but in terms of in terms of doing the actual teaching now to two to two groups, um, how are the teachers supposed to handle the workload? What extra help is being offered? Well, that's partly answered um, in, in the question you mentioned, Steve, the Remote Learning Center, which will provide some additional support. Uh, there may also be additional support from um, the uh, older grade uh, teachers in certain environments where they might be able to move over and provide some of um, that additional support. There's also, of course, time for, for planning and recognizing that a lot of remote learning has already been happening. This isn't like March where there was... Uh, a very quick shift and, uh, and an unexpected one. This planning for remote learning has been happening now for a very long time. And then also very importantly, it's time limited. Um, so, you know, and one of the great challenges that we had uh, in March was that you know, we didn't really know uh, maybe how long things might uh, go on or whether or not we'd return to school. We were fortunate to come back in June on a limited basis. Uh, we're much more confident now to be able to return to uh, to uh, classes uh, after that two-week um, uh, transition to uh, remote learning for the higher level grades and uh, some, of course, for the uh, K to six where that option is exercised by the parents. Okay, in a two-parter, um, I understand that the remote learning center is not fully staffed yet. Is it going to be fully staffed by the time it's required in January? And will it be offering direct uh, instruction to the student because uh, to my layman's mind, that's the only way it reduces the teacher's workload, not in a support role, but if it can take over some of that direct-to-student instruction. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. The, the Remote Learning Support Centre has certified teachers uh, embedded as part of that uh, program, and uh, so they will be doing direct uh, uh, teaching and learning supports to students. 
Uh, we do know that across the school division, some school divisions have, um, have uh, developed really good models, and so we've been at this for a while. And so we also want to leverage uh, the best practices in doing some planning uh, next week with school divisions to, tr to identify uh, how we can improve for, for all across the province. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be looking to try to leverage those best practices, um, but certainly they will be uh, teaching directly to students as well as offering learning supports and, um, uh, and, and uh, instructions to parents and caregivers as well. From CTV Winnipeg, Josh. Good afternoon, Minister. I uh, just wanted to circle back to uh, the issue on uh, putting this in place after the break and not before with a number of cases already in schools and the news release stating that uh, older students uh, might uh, transmit the virus. Um, how would you respond to people who are concerned about students potentially taking this virus home to their families over the break? So I would respond in, in the way that we've been responding, you know, throughout the school year and even before school came back. Um, you know, there's been a lot of planning that went into place to get back into um, into school in September. Uh, public health has been, you know, very involved, both in terms of the planning and then the follow-up uh, on a daily basis uh, as we've moved through the school year. Uh, while we have seen, of course, um, more cases come into schools than we would want because there are more cases in the community than we would want, and schools are part of the community. What we haven't seen evidence of is that widespread transmission within the school. So there are certainly cases that are coming to the school uh, from the community, uh, but because of the great work of teachers, EAs, others in the school system, uh, there has been, uh, comparatively to the community, much less transmission within the schools. And so we continue to rely on that public health advice that uh, schools are safe places to be and where they feel that there are other things that need to take place and the Hanover School Division is an example of that where the transmission rate in the community uh, went up fairly dramatically and public health made the decision to move the Hanover School Division uh, into remote learning. Well then they take that action. So it's not as though they are unwilling to take the action but they take the action based on the evidence that they have. This is a kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, with the emerging availability of rapid testing, uh, is the uh, Department of Education, uh, in conjunction with public health, uh, considering doing any surveillance testing, and when might we see that happen? Rapid testing is something that uh, our government and our premier uh, have indicated is a priority for us, and that, um, that we do believe that education uh, has a role uh, in that as well, and I do believe that you'll be hearing more about that uh, in the relatively near future. From City News, Mike. Hi, good afternoon. Mike Albanese from City News. A uh, question about hiring staff. Do we anticipate any issues hiring teachers, EAs, or substitutes? Uh, partway through what is a, the first pandemic school year? Is there any apprehension by those you're trying to hire or how are hiring going? I mean, there's a, a, I guess there's two parts of that question. It is a challenge, right, in terms of ensuring that we're um, able to have uh, the staff that we need within the school system. There are some mechanisms within education that have existed for a long time that allow for uh, additional support within uh, schools and some school divisions have been utilizing those uh, long-term uh, mechanisms. Of course they were doing planning in the summer um, and hiring additional staff. I think um, more than 400 additional staff, primarily teachers, uh, were hired in the lead up to this. Um, but of course, uh, you know, as uh, the virus has progressed more significantly than we would like in Manitoba, we've had more teachers that have either become sick themselves or have had contacts and had to self-isolate. And so rapid testing uh, is a part of uh, potentially uh, a solution. And so that is uh, being examined, has been mentioned before. In terms of apprehension, uh, whether or not teachers are sort of unwilling to come back, into uh, the system. Um, it's one of the reasons that we engage the Retired Teachers Association specifically on the Remote Learning Centre as an option for them to, to take. 
uh, that they might feel more comfortable operating in something like the remote learning center and so they have the the teaching uh, professionalism and uh, expertise, um, but it might mitigate some of their concerns around risk. So we are trying to find ways to engage those teachers who might otherwise not want to re-enter the, the, uh, the regular school system for a variety of different reasons. Thanks for that. And uh, follow-up here, I mean, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but is there an anticipated high uptake or low uptake to the remote learning for grades K to 6? Are we able to tell as an estimation right now? It's difficult to say, um, you know, until the offers are sort of made uh, and until the, now this announcement uh, is out. We've still maintained, um, you know, relatively high attendance within uh, the school system. Um, and, uh, and so that, I think, is an indication that uh, parents, uh, you know, value having their uh, students in class and, uh, and that students want to be in class. Uh, I mean, certainly, in the area that I represent, uh, I've had many, many phone calls about uh, the desire for uh, parents to have their students back in class, and I'm one of those parents. So when it's uh, when it's safe, I want my uh, my uh, son to be back uh, in class as uh, as quickly as possible. So um, there's clearly a desire, I think, for there to have the opportunity to be in class, but it has to be measured against the public health advice that we're getting. Uh, for for safety. So it's hard to say what the uptake will be in terms of uh, remote learning. Most of the school divisions have been offering uh, remote learning already and there certainly has been some uptake but the attendance in school has remained relatively strong. From CHVN, Taylor. Hi, good afternoon. Um, you talk about the remote learning center being a place to give uh, support to students but can you specify what that support is especially with students who will be learning different things in their own classrooms and teachers having their own specialty. I, I missed the last end of that and, and their own part of me. Just if you could just repeat the last portion of that sentence. Yeah, um, just how will they be giving support to students when t uh, students have their own things that they are learning in their own classrooms and teachers themselves have their own specialties? Yeah, no, for sure. So obviously we want, uh, you know, there's a curriculum that our teachers follow uh, throughout the year, but there is some variation and flexibility within the classroom. And so uh, they'll, it'll need to be a careful co collaboration uh, across those teachers. I think teachers have talked about the importance of collaborative planning and uh, consultation, and so this would be no different. Uh, so we'd want to see that occurring. Uh, some of the ideas that uh, we've, we've, we've talked about include project-based learning uh, whereby an assignment could be provided for up to two weeks. Uh, so it doesn't require as much interaction between the, the teacher, but that obviously does uh, require more uh, collaboration and support from the parents or the caregivers. So it will be on a case-by-case -case basis uh, and it'll be in consultation with the home teacher. I think the most important piece that we want to do is the continuity of learning uh, and that relationship between the teacher and the student. And it's a short period of time, so we don't want to have a situation where we're disrupting that learning and, and that, uh, that relationship. So that would be top of mind for us. And EAs uh, who normally would be in classrooms for grade 7 to 12, what will they be doing for those two weeks? Well, there's lots of opportunities around tutoring and check-ins, uh, just uh, having the opportunity to, to ensure that the students are, uh, are following up with the, with the work that is occurring, uh, having the opportunity to have a touch point with the education system. Uh, teachers may not have the opportunity to do those check-ins, and so EAs uh, have the skills and the abilities to interact with students and provide support. As well as uh, we do have a resource teacher that will be hired as part of the support uh, team and we anticipate having students with special needs that are at home and doing remote learning and so those EAs can also provide that continuity of learning uh, for those students. From the Thompson Citizen, Ian. Good afternoon, Mr. Gertson. Um, I'm just wondering in uh, the School District of Mystery Lake and Thompson in the spring, like up to one in six students didn't have internet access at home. Uh, you know, how is the remote learning going to provide equivalent instruction to those who have internet access and participate in online activities and to those who don't? 
You know, that, uh, and I think uh, Deputy Rudy may want to, to speak to some of the, the details as well, but I, I do recognize that um, there is variability in the different parts of, of Manitoba when it comes to access to a variety of different things, and certainly uh, technology and internet connection is one of those. So um, while I know that there are other means by which there can be um, interaction and, and connection, and we've supported those uh, means, it doesn't mean that uh, it isn't a challenge. Now, again, I think this is for a relatively short period of time, and so that will be uh, uh, helpful. It's not an undefined period of time, and there's time for that preparation for those uh, two weeks of remote learning uh, as well. But I don't want to minimize the fact that it isn't exactly the same in every, um, in every part of the province. But, Deputy? Yeah, no, I would, I would add that Mystery Lake and, and Frontier, uh, for that matter, have really had good experience in trying to ensure continuity of learning for their students. And uh, they've shared with us many stories of, of how they've adapted and, and been flexible, both in terms of the delivery of print-based materials and, uh, and trying to, um, you know, the challenges with technology, but also geography in terms of how they're getting that education to students and how they're leveraging different parts of the community uh, to ensure that students learn. So the resilience of, of the North in particular, and I think really does come out quite loudly when we're planning uh, with those partners. And um, they, you know, they've been, they've been planning just like every other school division and trying to figure out how do they cater the, to their particular student population and so I would say that they're just as ready as every other school division in terms of figuring out how to ensure that continuity of learning. It may not look the same and it may not be remote, it, it, uh, sorry digital, it may be print based uh, but again um, have a lot of confidence in those, in those school divisions of the north uh, in terms of the preparations that they've undertaken. Okay thank you and then just the second question, I mean, is there a concern that uh, like K-6 to teachers are only going to have two weeks to sort of prepare to be delivering remote learning and in-class learning while also, you know, teaching their classes right now? Like, are they being asked to do too much between now and Christmas break? I never want to minimize, you know, the challenge for any profession uh, in a pandemic. This is obviously something that all of us in society are going through for the first time in our living memory. And so the challenges are, are, are there in every profession. And certainly uh, teachers have stepped up as well uh, in a very, very difficult time. They've done a remarkable, remarkable job. I would never minimize the challenge that they and EAs um, and uh, janitors working in the system, um, bus drivers, Everybody has had to take on a very, very difficult challenge. Um, and that's true in every part of society. So not to minimize um, uh, the efforts that they have to take on for sure. Um, we are glad that, you know, the standard break uh, is coming up. We do know that, uh, that that's going to benefit teachers to be able to get that time uh, and to, uh, to be able to be with, um, with their own immediate families uh, in their household during that time. And we think that that'll be an important uh, break for them as well. But I don't want to minimize, you know, the challenges that, that are happening either within the education system for teachers, um, but also uh, not to suggest that those challenges aren't happening everywhere uh, in society. It is a, a difficult time. Everybody's doing their best uh, in this time. And uh, I do believe that, uh, you know, from an education perspective, uh, that our teachers have stepped up and done uh, tremendous uh, work. They uh, are deserving of the, um, of the Christmas break that they, or holiday break that they're going to be getting. Um, and uh, I also know that they'll step up when it comes to those additional uh, different two weeks after, uh, after the break. And, uh, and that uh, we certainly hope that they will continue on to have a great school year beyond that. Because we, we also have to remember that as challenging and as difficult as, as this is for, for teachers and as it is for EAs and it is for janitors and everybody else who's working, bus drivers, everybody else who's working in the system, um, it is really important for our, our students to be able to be uh, in schools. Uh, where they can, and if we can do that safely, it is a it is our absolute top priority. And uh, we do hear some, you know, many many remarkable stories 
of, uh, of how the staff is stepping up to make this as good a school year for, uh, for students. It might be uh, different and difficult, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, not going to be uh, rewarding for, for students in many, many different ways. We might not always see that until the, other, uh, until the other side of this. So very, very appreciative of the work that everybody is doing in the, uh, in the school system. Uh, we know that they're going to get a well-deserved break in the traditional break uh, for, um, for uh, those who are working in the school system and then the two weeks after that is going to look uh, a little bit different but uh, we think it's for the, the safety of the community for sure and, uh, and then ultimately it will be beneficial for uh, our students and those who are working in the system. Our final reporter this afternoon from the CBC National News, Cameron. Hi, Minister. Um, just to clarify, I think this kind of goes to the first question you're asked. In terms of the COVID numbers and the potential that we could find ourselves in a worse situation or at least as bad situation, once kids are out of school, they're out of school. I know in my school division personally, when we've been offered to take our kids out, they're out. Uh, we don't have the option to put them back in. So if people are opting to take their K-6 to kids out, should they be doing that under the caveat that if things get worse, they will not have the option to put them back in? Or I guess, should they assume that it could go more than two weeks is what I'm asking. So, yeah, very good question. I think that we want to give some assurances to parents and caregivers that this, this plan is really a preventative plan uh, in anticipation of increased transmission. Uh, that decisions that parents are making for this period of time are intended to be limited to up until January 15th. We'll be working with school divisions. Uh, we're going to try to learn from our prior experience with remote learning and, and try to improve it and make sure that it's a balance that supports teachers and, and students uh, throughout that two-week period. And so there's no uh, obligation for parents uh, to uh, extend beyond those two weeks. This is, uh, like I said, it is a preventative measure, very targeted approach to try to minimize any additional transmission that may occur as a result of people that, uh, that are out of their traditional routines uh, as a result of, uh, of a holiday break. And uh, just a follow-up question on the funding. On the $185.4 million in funding under safe schools that you've, that you've identified here, a lot of people I know in the work in education, they're wondering how much of that money has actually been spent. On the press release, you have it allocated different ways and some will be spent by some. But of that 185.4 pool right now, how much of that money is actually spent? How much of it do you actually have in the event that you know, to get you through the rest of the school year, whatever that looks like. I think that it's being spent at around uh, $15 million a month. This is approximately what we're seeing now. Uh, of course, it takes a little while for us to catch up on some of, uh, of the costs that are coming in, but it seems to be uh, from, a, um, from a school division level that we're getting at about $15 million a month. And then, of course, there's additional costs that are being uh, incurred, whether, um, you know, that is for... Uh, you know, the different support that we're going to be providing uh, on uh, remote learning or other sort of uh, opportunities. But it's about running at about $15 million a month at this point, uh, but recognizing that that could, be, uh, that could be changing. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This concludes our media briefing.